Now, uh, what I tell my colleagues when grading papers, and I'll tell you is uh, what to look for, are first of all, uh, did the person answer the question? And you'd be surprised how often people don't answer uh, the question. They see a word that looks familiar, intentionality, free will, and they remember some stuff in their notes about that. So they write down everything they can think of uh, from their notes. That's not a good idea. Uh, uh, so the first thing, try to answer the question. Think of the poor examiner. Uh, he or she worked very hard thinking up this question. And if you don't answer the question, their feelings are hurt. And you don't want to hurt their feelings because then they get depressed. And you don't want people grading your exams when they're depressed. Okay, so that's number one. Uh, do they, uh, did they answer the question? And then the uh, second a question I ask is, uh, do they actually know anything? Um, it's, uh, there is a lot of material that I try uh, to convey in this course, and I, uh, if the exam is, at any, uh, is well designed, uh, you should have a chance to show what you know. And then third, are they, are they capable of any thought of their own? Can they think on their own? And that, after all, is the uh, the whole point of the course is that you should learn uh, to be able to think hard about philosophical questions because that will carry over to all sorts of other questions. And besides, they're the most important questions anyway, so I want you to be able to think about them. And then fourth question I ask is, can they write English sentences? I realize paragraphs are too much to ask in, an, in a blue book. I, I, this may be the only university in the world where you're supposed to bring your own damn blue books, but it's a great tradition, so bring your own blue books. Uh, uh, and if you forget a blue book, don't worry, because uh, we'll have extra sheets of paper that we can rip off and, and give to you. But try to bring your own blue books. Uh, but it's nice if you can write English sentences. The all-time record is held by a guy I had when I first started teaching in Berkeley who wrote an entire three-hour exam without a single English sentence. It was an essay exam. He did not produce a single grammatical English sentence. A and when I pointed out that his grade suffered as a result, he was morally indignant. Uh, this was, he, uh, this, he told me this was the first time he was a graduating senior, the first time in his four years at Berkeley that anybody had asked him to write an English sentence. He was a chemistry major, and he was perfectly happy to write chemical formulas for us, but sentences, why sentences? I was reminded uh, of, uh, uh, of a great lecture I heard by uh, the head of the provisional government who was driven out uh, by uh, Lenin and Trotsky, his name was Alexander Karinsky. And it was a moment of pure history in the Pauli Ballroom. Karinsky, who must have been in his 90s, who was like everybody else, wound up at the Stanford think tank, at the Stanford uh, Center uh, for whatever it's a center for. It's a center for collecting money without actually doing anything. And, and that's, I bore that. That sounded like a good idea. They have not offered me a position, but in any case, I approve of the idea. Anyway, Kerensky was down there, and he came and gave a lecture here. And I went, you're getting a chance to hear history. I mean, oh, this is like hearing Napoleon give a lecture. This is, I mean, he, he, he wasn't as competent as Napoleon, but he, was a, a, he, he gave uh, a great lecture and I was absolutely spellbound because he did not produce a single grammatical English sentence. He began, why this happen Russia? And we all wondered, why this happen Russia? And he said, 300 years. And we all thought, yeah, 300 years. Great British Empire. Long pause. And then he had a thought. And France, and France, he said. And we all nodded, yes, and France. Uh, and the lecture went on like that. I could, I mean, uh, if I'd had a lot to drink, I could do an imitation of the voice of history, Alexander Kerensky. We ought to see, some of you, want, this is a homework assignment. Get on to Google and see if you can get a tape recording of one of Kerensky's lecture, a particular lecture he gave in the Pauli Ballroom. That was particularly moving. It was a particularly Berkeley experience. Uh, because this was in the time when there was more of a revolutionary fervor than there is now. And in the upper, um, the upper plaza, 
there was a radical speaker and you could, uh, the, it was a hot day in May and all the windows were open and you could hear uh, the radical uh, mission being intoned from the upper plaza and on the lower plaza was a rock group known as the Purple Earthquake. Uh, I have no idea if the Purple Earthquake has become immortal, but certainly they were loud then. So I heard the voice of history, Alexander Kerensky, together with the voice of contemporary history, the call to revolution from the upper plaza, and wonderful background music better than anything in Hollywood from the Purple Earthquake. Anyway, I'm digressing. Now we get back to serious work. Oh, okay, anybody have questions about the exam? Uh, well, you'll have questions. Now, we only have one more week after this, uh, but that's it. We just have next week. I used to teach the last week, but the university decided that's a bad idea. Uh, they have something called R and R and R, and I don't know how many R's they got or what they stand for, but you get time off. Uh, and as I said, I'm going to Morocco for what that's worth. I don't know how I get into these things. All right. So I will give you exam questions. I, I'll give you sample questions, and this is the time and place of the exam. Any, no um, questions about the exam? Everybody's uh, on board. As you know, it counts roughly 40% of your grade. And the exam is a great, uh, well, it's a good idea. If the exam is intelligently designed, if the exam is intelligently designed and you are prepared for it, it ought to be fun. Uh, you should have a good time writing the exam uh, because it gives you a chance to show your stuff and put your thoughts together. All right. Last time, we were locked into the problem of free will, and I, don't, I, 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 don't, I guess I'm determined uh, to try to keep going with that issue. Uh, so let me uh, state what the questions are. First of all, <clears throat> is compatibilism a solution to the problem of free will? That sounds like an exam question. Let somebody write that down. Is compatibilism a solution to the problem of free will? And I have to tell you, I think most professional philosophers today I think it is. I think it just uh, avoids the question. It changes the subject. Uh, the question is, are there any human actions which are such that the antecedents to the action were not causally sufficient for that particular action? Are there actions such that, given the causal situation at the time, the agent could have done something different? Uh, and, and notice I say that without using any words like freedom and determinism. Uh, it isn't about free will and determinism as, as names of, uh, as concepts in English. It's about the causal structure of the universe and how that relates to human behavior. And you might say, well, why is there a problem anyhow? We know perfectly well everything is causally determined. And as I mentioned last time, the reason there's a special problem about free will is we all have the experience of what I call a gap. We have the experience of free action. And it's un if it's an illusion, it's other unlike other illusions because you can't shake it off. Uh, you can uh, realize that the, the uh, uh, standard optical illusions are just illusions and you can live your life on the assumption that there are illusions, but you really can't do that with, with uh, free will. You have to assume when you're making up your mind that you actually have alternatives. And I illustrated that point by pointing out to you that if you refuse to exercise your free will, you say, I refuse to, to, to do that. I refuse to make up my mind because I believe in determinism. That itself is only intelligible to you if you take it as a free action on your part. So we can't shake off if it is an illusion, it's not one we can shake off. All right, but now the problem of free will can be stated without using the traditional vocabulary of freedom and determinism. I think the compatibilists are probably right, uh, that there's a use of these expressions in ordinary English where we would say he did it of his own free will, even in cases where uh, we knew that the uh, action was determined. If all actions are indeed determined, we would still have a use for the notion of free will, uh, that would, uh, for, the, for the use of the concept, for the use of the vocabulary, because there are cases where your action is caused not by somebody putting a gun at your head or you've got some psychological compulsion or you're under duress or you're a, 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 a schizophrenic, uh, but uh, I, there are cases where 
your action is determined by such things as your character, your inclinations, your beliefs, and your desires. And in those cases, we say in ordinary English, you did it of your own free will. That's true, but irrelevant, at least to the problem as I construe it. The problem as I construe it is a problem about causation. It's about determinism, not as an item in ordinary English, but as describing the causal structure of the world. And if the causal structure of the world is such that everything has causally sufficient conditions, and every event has causally sufficient conditions, and human actions are events, then it follows that they have causally sufficient conditions, that the antecedents of the act are sufficient to fix that particular act. That's the issue for me. Okay, so I'm going to assume that there really is a problem, and that the reason it's a special problem, uh, the reason that free will is especially difficult, I, is precisely because we all have the experience of freedom, what I call the gap, and we can't uh, shake it off. We can't uh, get rid of this experience. We can't pretend uh, that uh, it's, even if we believe that it's an illusion, we still have to act on the assumption that it's real. So it's different from other illusions. It's different from the Miller liar illusion, uh, where yes, the, the lines look different lengths, but you know that they're really the same length. In the case of free will, you have to act on the assumption that you really have a choice, even if abstractly, philosophically, you're convinced that you don't have a choice. Okay, how are we supposed to settle this? Well, I like to think of these things as real uh, empirical questions. How would the world be if determinism were true? And how would it be if free will were true? And one way, one way to do philosophy is to think of it as a series of engineering problems. Suppose you're designing a robot whose behavior is determined, and you're designing a robot uh, that has free will. What would you do in your designs? Now let's assume you knew how to solve the hardest problem of all, and that is how to build a conscious robot. Nobody knows, nobody has the faintest idea how to do that, how to make a conscious robot, because we don't know how our brain produces consciousness, so we don't know how to produce it artificially. This, by the way, is why robotics has been so disappointing. Uh, in the, at, as the 20th century grew to a close, uh, people had been saying for decades, we will soon have household robots that will uh, be completely, uh, behave just like ordinary people, and they'll do all the housework and take care of the kids and entertain us with conversation and tell us jokes when we got bored. Uh, they stopped saying that about uh, 1990, because the end of the century was getting too close. Uh, rob robotics is, it turned out to be, well, it costs a lot of money, but it hasn't actually uh, anything like lived up to its promise, though, as you all know, there's been an enormous increase in computational power. And I think the short answer to why robotics has been so disappointing is nobody knows how to make a conscious robot. Uh, if you could make a conscious robot, Consciousness has the capacity for a prodigious amount of information processing in a, in a very short space of real time. Uh, and uh, what you can do with, with the consciousness is you can coordinate a whole lot of different types of information. Right now I coordinate my thoughts about free will with my awareness of the people in the room and my walking around on the floor and my wondering about whether or not this is working and so on. All of these in a single conscious field. And we don't know how to do anything like that, even with vastly incre vast increases in computational power. Okay, I'm digressing. How, the question is, how would you build a conscious robot that had, uh, was determined, and how would you build a conscious robot that had free will? Well, it's easy enough with the deterministic case. I, you would use a standard um, computational techniques in cognitive science, traditional cognitive science, with its computational conception of the mind, and you would program your robot to behave in certain sorts of ways under certain circumstances. You might even program the robot to believe that it had free will. You might program it with a sense uh, of what I call a gap, since you can, uh, we've decided that you can, uh, uh, you can create a conscious robot. You could give it a sense of the gap, but we would know that its behavior is completely determined. 
But if you were going to program a robot that had free will, what would you do? How would you go about it? Well, later on, I'm going to say you would have to invoke a quantum indeterminism at some point. But it's not at all obvious how that's going to be a solution for us, because as I told you last time, the fact that the universe contains this indeterministic component, quantum indeterminacy, seems of no help at all with the problem of free will, because quantum indeterminacy is simply randomness. As I mentioned uh, on Tuesday, quantum mechanics is different from other types of physical theories in that it puts randomness not just in our epistemology, not just in what we know. We, the fall of the coin as head or tails is random only in the sense that we don't know how it's going to turn out. But it's completely determined, assuming that you can treat it as a Newtonian system. It's completely determined, and its behavior is knowable. But on the quantum mechanical account, indeterminacy becomes part of nature. Randomness becomes an ontological and not just an epistemic phenomenon. So I don't know how to build a conscious robot that has free will, but I'll say some more about that later. Okay, so we've tr if we treat it as an engineering problem, then it looks like uh, there is a fairly simple solution to the engineering problem if determinism is true. Now, there's a hard solution. How the hell do you make the robot conscious? We, as I said, we don't know how to do that, and we're a long way from being able to do that. But the, um, I, once you've got a conscious robot, if you've got a mechanism whereby you can program the behavior, then it looks like it's very easy to build a conscious robot that was completely determined. What about one that had free will? That's tougher. I'm going to explore that in a little more detail. Okay, everybody up with us now. I want to stop for questions because I'm trying to take seriously uh, the idea uh, that freedom of the will and determinism are alternative hypotheses about how the world works. And in particular, they're alternative hypotheses about, the, about how the human and animal brain works. And, and more specifically, they're hypotheses about how consciousness works in the human and animal brain. Because a problem of free will only arises for a conscious being. The gap only is part of the experience of an agent that is conscious. I don't know how you would have uh, uh, anything other than randomness uh, if you try to build a totally unconscious free will agent. So it's a peculiarity of our consciousness that we have the experience of the gap. And the question is, we want to know, it, is that experience an illusion, or does it correspond to how the world really works? Okay, questions about all of that. Well, let's go the next step. I said, let's try it as an engineering problem, and we only got so far with that. So I now want to hit, take a historical case and, uh, and ask how it could have worked in a historical case. Now. Uh, if you go to art museums uh, as an obsessive, the way I do, one of the recurring themes in European art is the judgment of Paris. And you all remember what happened in the judgment of Paris. Paris was the son of the king of Troy. And he had what nowadays we'd call a summer job uh, looking after sheep. He was a sheep herder. And Zeus, uh, the chief god, the big honcho of the gods, had a problem. The problem was he had this golden apple, and he's supposed to give it to the best-looking goddess. And it's because it says on the apple, to the fairest. And that didn't mean the one that is the best umpire or referee. It meant the one who's best-looking, the most beautiful. Now, these three, uh, I don't know if I can call them girls, these three goddesses were competing for the golden apple. Their names were Hera, Aphrodite, and Pallas Athena. Now, I always went to these European art museums and thought Paris was really trying to decide who was the best looking. They were Hera, Pallas Athena, and Aphrodite. All right, 
in fact, according uh, to the uh, more scholarly mythologies that I have read, what he was really selecting was the best bribe. Each of these, you see, Zeus didn't want to get in trouble with, you know, I don't want to get in a hassle with goddesses. Even if you're a big honcho god, you don't want them, uh, you don't want them pissed off at you, if that's the right verb, uh, uh, for the way goddesses respond. So he gave the apple to Paris to make up his mind about it, uh, and not, uh, he, so that Zeus himself wouldn't be troubled. Now, uh, uh, Hera offered to make him ruler of Europe and Asia, uh, Pallas Athena offered to enable him to lead the Trojans in a military victory over the Greeks. And Aphrodite promised him the most beautiful woman in the world. Now, I won't say it was a no-brainer, okay? He had to think about it for a while. And what we're discussing now is the process of his thought. And we will suppose that at T1, as philosophers like to say, at T1, he's presented with a choice. Here's the apple, here are the three goddesses, here are the offers they're making, which one are you gonna give it to? And at T2, he makes the decision. So here he has thought processes, and here he has the decision. Now we know what happened. He gave the apple to Aphrodite and she gave him the best looking girl, in, not just in town, but in the world. Uh, her name was Helen and when, when he, got, he got her okay, but it, all hell broke loose then, all kinds of problems that I won't tell you about. Uh, I mean, uh, battles and all sorts of horrible things. A thousand ships were launched famously, uh, et cetera. All right, now here's our question. <laughs> Is the process by which he goes from the thought to the decision. Is that a deterministic process? Well, that question, since we know that each of these stages is completely caused by and realized in the neurobiology, we have neurobiology state one leading to neurobiology state two, we're asking the question whether or not these processes are determined. Now we're supposing that these processes here, whereby he's thinking about it, that these have gaps, that, that he has a sense, well, I'm, I'm thinking about giving it to her or her or her, but really it's up to me, I have to make up my mind. There, we have an experiential gap at the psychological level. This is the psychological level where he's making up his mind. And I'm now going to suggest something that I think is important. It seems to me psychological determinism is probably false. Just at the psychological level, we need to make a distinction between uh, cases where you are acting uh, in, a, in a rage or a frenzy or under hypnosis or under the influence of drugs or under uh, uh, some sort of psychopathic condition. You're a, you're a, a paranoid schizophrenic. Those are cases where you do not have, where the gap is an illusion, where you don't really have the gap, and often in those cases you don't have a sense of the gap. If you're in a rage, you don't have the feeling, well, I'm doing this, but I could be doing something else. But those contrast with the cases where you really are trying to make up your mind. Who should you vote for? Where, uh, where should you spend your summer vacation? Uh, should you go to law school or not? What are you gonna do after you graduate? Those are cases where you actually experience the gap, and I think empirically, it's probably likely, this is just a hypothesis on my part, but from what we know, psychological determinism is false. But that's no use to our overall problem of determinism because these gaps here, which are genuine, would have to be matched by gaps at the level of the neurobiology if free will is to be real, if there's to be genuine free will, because if the situation of the brain at S1, state one, is causally sufficient for the situation of the brain at S2. And at S2, Paris's arm goes out to give the apple to Aphrodite, then his behavior is determined 
and all of ours is as well. I've mentioned this because it's a kind of test case. Now I'm going to go through it carefully. Paris, unlike the gods, was an actual human being. Uh, when he gave her the apple, the acetylcholine at the axon end plates of his motor neurons had to activate the muscle fibers in such a way that the arm went out by straightforward causal necessity. All of these are straightforward causal mechanisms. Now we're going to suppose in examining this uh, example, I can't even spell neurobiology, I guess it's a bad day, hang on. If one th don't do anything else, I'm going to spell neurobiology correctly. Neurobiology, okay. Neurobiology, okay. Um, we're going to examine now the hypothesis that his uh, sense of freedom is real, that it corresponds to something in reality, and we're supposing that the psychological processes at this level were not causally sufficient, that he had genuine freedom, but that's an illusion if each of the neurobiological states that underlies those psychological processes is causally sufficient for the next state. Now we have to suppose he has no external stimuli. That is, he's given the choice at T1, and we'll suppose he closes his eyes so he doesn't get any stimulus coming in. It's all what goes on in his brain that determines the situation of the brain at S2. So we can now state the hypothesis of determinism with a little more precision. If the state of Paris's brain at S1, with no other stimuli coming in, is causally sufficient for the state of his brain at S2, we'll suppose there's a 10 second time lag here to make it realistic that there are no outside stimuli. If the situation here is causally sufficient for the situation here, and the situation here is, is fixes uh, uh, the uh, up by bottom-up causation, fixes the conscious decision at this point, uh, then his decision is determined. And if he's determined, then all of us are, because this I'm taking this as a, a standard case, as a case, uh, as a good test case. Okay, now it's easy to see what the world would be like. Uh, if he's determined, and the answer is, and I think most, uh, every brain scientist I know assumes this, uh, that a brain's an organ like any other. Nobody thinks the stomach has free will or the liver has free will. Why should the brain have free will? Why should the brain be any different from any other, um, any other organ, any other neurobiological condition? of the human being. That's the argument for determinism. What's the argument for free will? This is the, what we're now uh, examining. And we just have labels, let's call the hypothesis that we're completely determined, we'll call that hypothesis one. And hypothesis two, will that be the hypothesis that free will is not an illusion, that there actually is a, a, an absence of causally sufficient conditions for the stages of the neurobiological processes at the bottom level. Okay, now I want to stop for questions about that because I'm now going to propose answers to that question. Uh, one of the things that puzzles a lot of people is, well, how can he be free up here if he's determined down here and each state here is fixed by the state down there? If, if you have complete neurobiological determinism of your conscious states and the neurobiological determinism is sufficient for the next a neurobiological state given the absence of external stimuli, then how can you have any causal gaps at the higher level? And you all know the answer to that. The short answer is multiple realizability. Uh, there are different ways that this system here can be realized in the neurobiology, and the neurobiology can be completely causally sufficient, even though under the description of the psychological state that he has, and uh, the psychological state being things like, boy, it sure would be fun to be ruler of Earth and Asia. On the other hand, wow, think of the best looking girl in the world. I mean, those, those states are not causally sufficient for the next state as states, even though the underlying neurobiology might be causally sufficient. So that's how you reconcile. Uh, it, it, uh, the following three propositions look like they may, might be inconsistent. You have freedom at the psychological level, 
The psychological level is completely determined by the neurobiological level, and you have no determine you have no freedom at the neurobiological level. Those look inconsistent, but they aren't once you recognize that the description under which you specify a psychological state, though it, uh, it requires a, an underlying neurobiological state, the description under which the psychological state is specified need not specify a deterministic feature of the psychological state. So you can have psychological states determined by brain states, even though the psychological states are not causally sufficient for the next psychological state. Questions now? Yes. Everything. Yes. Yeah. So then, how can you ask someone that this unethical behavior? Or this is the reason that people get excited about the problem of free will. I, I, it's not the reason I get excited, but the reason most people get excited is because they think without free will, you have no moral responsibility. You can't blame anybody for what they were determined to do. And this, I think, is, I'm not sure about this, but I think it's one of the things that drives compatibilism is the feeling, look, we want to be able to hold people morally responsible even though all of their behavior is determined. So we say, well, there are two ways your behavior is determined. One is if it's determined by your inner psychological condition, your character and your thought processes. And the other, if it's determined by external force, what you're forced to do. So the idea is you can blame Hitler. You can hold Hitler morally responsible even though all of his behavior was determined. That's what appeals, I think, one of the things that appeals to people about compatibilism. Uh, I think it's, un uh, for reasons I told you, I think it's unsatisfactory, but I'm not now so much concerned about moral responsibility, and I think you're right, that is why people get excited about this. Uh, but I'm now concerned with whether or not we can take seriously the idea I, uh, that uh, free, free will might be true, that there might actually be such thing as freedom of the will. Okay, other questions? Do you have your hand up? Yeah. yeah I was wondering, uh, don't the presence of these gaps at the uh, psychological level have to have some sort of uh, neurobiological event? Causing well, that's the, uh, the idea uh, that we're probing now. The, um, the point is this, is what we're saying is that the gappy lines here are supposed to illustrate the fact that each state is, at the psychological level is not causally sufficient by itself, that is, in terms of its psychological features for the next state. The question then is, since each of those states is fixed by the neurobiological level, is each state of the neurobiology causally sufficient for the next state? And I must say that does sound plausible to me. I mean, that's, I, I, I don't know any brain scientist who would have doubts about that. You have no outside stimulus, you got no uh, new stimuli coming in, then uh, is the process which the brain goes through completely fixed by the causal structure. Sounds plausible. Hypothesis one looks like it's winning the argument. What would hypothesis two look like? Well, you have to ask yourself, is there any part of the universe uh, where determinism doesn't hold? And the answer, of course, is it's, uh, the part of the universe where it doesn't hold is at the quantum level. And it's a little misleading to say that's a part, because, of course, the whole universe uh, is, a, uh, is quantum phenomena all the way up and down. The indeterminacy manifests itself at the micro level because the various indeterminacies t tend to cancel out at the higher level. They tend to cancel out at the level of baseballs and car engines. You can neg neglect quantum indeterminacy when you're playing baseball. But in fact, it's still there. It's just that the, the different indeterminacies tend to cancel each other out so you can predict the baseball as a Newtonian system. Now, as I said last time, it always seemed to me quantum indeterminacy is just irrelevant to the problem of free will because quantum indeterminacy gives you randomness. And free will has to mean more than just random behavior. Random behavior is not the same as free behavior. Now, that always seemed to me right, but that argument, as I gave you, actually commits what's called a fallacy of composition. 
from the, the fallacy of composition is the fallacy of assuming that something that is true of the elements of a system, the, the elements that compose a system is true of the whole system composed by those elements. That's why it's called a fallacy of composition. So if you have, the, the brain is made of neurons, and let's suppose the neurons are firing at the rate of 40 hertz, that's 40 cycles per second, then it would be a fallacy of composition to infer then the whole brain is firing at the rate of 40 hertz. Because what's true at the micro level is not necessarily true at the macro level. It's a fallacy to assume that the micro level features are features of the macro level, even though the macro level is composed of the micro elements. So the argument that says quantum indeterminacy generates only randomness is not, uh, a, 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 is not valid as it stands because it might be well, it might be the case that there was quantum indeterminacy at the micro level and the quantum indeterminacy led to an absence of causally sufficient conditions at the large macro level, at this top level, without it being the case I, that you had randomness at the top level. So let's, let's explore it. Let's see what it would look like. We do not know how the brain causes consciousness, and it's a scandal uh, that we don't know how it works, and there's a, been a whole lot of work on this, and there still is, and I've just reviewed another book about this by Antonio Damasio, and that, that's coming out in the New York Review, but it takes them forever. I just did the proofs, but it should come out in the next couple of weeks, though. With them, it could be the next couple of months. Uh, anyway, we're all at the mercy of publishers. You're going to suffer from this for the rest of your life, so you might as well get used to it. Okay, now, we don't know how the brain works, and there are various theorists that say, well, in order to understand how the brain works, you have to see it as a quantum system. Consciousness is generated at the quantum level. There are people who say that. There are various theorists who think you have to have a quantum mechanical explanation of consciousness. Um, uh, however, uh, something ought to worry them, and that is no competent neurobiologist takes them very seriously, but I'll tell you their names. There's Stuart Hameroff in Arizona, uh, and then there's Roger Penrose in uh, Oxford, and there's another guy whose name I've repressed. I, I know the guy, but two guys is enough. Hameroff and Penrose both believe this. Uh, and, but as I told you, it ought to worry them that the heavy-duty brain stabbers don't take them seriously. Now, they're very smart guys, but, it, but their views are not mainstream views. But let's suppose, for the sake of argument, they're right. Let's suppose that you have to have a quantum mechanical explanation of consciousness. Then you would have to hypothesize consciousness at the level of decision-making, consciousness at the level of active consciousness as opposed to the passive consciousness of perception manifests the absence of causally sufficient conditions characteristic of the quantum level without manifesting the randomness of the quantum level. Now, the reason I put off saying this till the end of the semester is it makes me want to throw up whenever I say that, but I'm going to say the damn thing again because we've decided we're going to push this to the limit, see how far we can go with the idea that free will might be real. And hypothesis two says the only part of nature that is known for a fact to be non-deterministic is the quantum level. Uh, determinism and free will are issues about the nature of consciousness. So if free will is real, then there would one have to be a have to be a quantum mechanical explanation of consciousness. But the explanation would have to show how. Consciousness inherits the absence of causally sufficient conditions of the quantum level without inheriting the randomness. So the idea is this. Random quantum behavior produces the consciousness that I'm now manifesting when I explain the problem of free will to you. But that random uh, quantum behavior gives me a consciousness which inherits or has the absence of causally sufficient conditions that was characteristic of the quantum level, but it is not thereby random. It is a, uh, it's a fallacy of composition to suppose that it has to be random. 
Uh, okay, so we're saying this is how it might be. It might be that the brain produces consciousness in a way that's explained by the quantum level, that the consciousness that's produced has a lack of causally sufficient conditions, so the gap is real at this level. These, this gappy character of consciousness is real. But though the consciousness at that level lacks causally sufficient conditions in the sense that each state of consciousness is not causally sufficient by itself for the next state, all the same, you do not get randomness at that level. You get a rational structure at the, at the conscious level. Now notice, from the physicist's point of view, it's still random because you still can't predict the next state on the basis of the previous state. Quite so. But on the basis of our experience, our, con our sense, our, our conscious experience of making up our mind, it's not random. Uh, they, there is an ab we sense an absence of causally sufficient conditions, but that doesn't mean at the experiential level it's random, though still, even though at the physical level it's still random, uh, because at the physical level you cannot make predictions based on causally sufficient conditions. Okay, that's hypothesis two. Let me just go through this because I'm going to get I mean, a long piece of spaghetti and I want to get it all out, and then we can chop it up. I don't know if I like that metaphor, but anyway, here comes, I'm spitting out the rest of it. Okay, is there any argument at all for, I mean, it sounds crazy on the face of it, but that's the best I can do to rescue determinism as a plausible hypothesis, as an even possible hypothesis. Is there any argument at all uh, against hypothesis one and in favor of hypothesis two? Well, the only argument I can think of is an evolutionary argument, and that argument says it is an extremely expensive phenotype for evolution to have given us the consciousness of free rational decision making if it does no work at all, if it's a total epiphenomenon. And when I say it's expensive, I mean it's expensive in real terms. That damn brain takes a lot of blood flow. All you're going to do is scratch your scalp, cut your scalp, and you'll be amazed. Well, I don't want to get into that. You'll be amazed at how much you bleed. So you've got an enormous... The, the, the conscious, rational decision-making part of the brain is a very expensive piece of biological apparatus, and it's just not like anything in nature for such an extremely biologically expensive phenotype to play no role whatever. Think of it diachronically. We spend a lot of time educating ourselves and our children so they will better be able to make rational decisions. But now, if there's no such thing as rational decision making, if it's all an illusion, if everything that ever happens was completely written in the book of history at the time of the Big Bang 13 billion years ago, if free rational decision making is a total illusion, it's just a massive uh, illusion, then it's unlike the rest of nature, the rest of biology, to give us an expensive, an extremely expensive a phenotype like that, an extremely expensive uh, uh, actual feature of our lives if it doesn't do anything, if it plays no role, if it's like the appendix, it's totally epiphenomenal. Okay, so those are the two hypotheses. Hypothesis one, I must say, sounds more plausible to me. Uh, we're given the illusion of free will. It's an illusion we can't shake off. But if I, but hypothesis two seems to me a kind of possibility. The possibility is that you have to assume one, a quantum mechanical explanation of consciousness, and two, that consciousness inherits the absence of causally sufficient conditions at the quantum level without inheriting the randomness at the phenomenological at the conscious level. And that, that last part seems plausible. We don't experience our uh, thought processes as random, but they, might, but they are experienced as not causally sufficient. However, I have to say, I think the whole discussion is very unsatisfactory. Now, I, I, I have had a chance to give this in various lectures, and in one lecture, a guy said to me, well, what makes you think you can answer this now? Why not wait a couple of centuries and see what science comes up with, uh, I, I, and maybe we'll have a, a much deeper understanding 
uh, of the non-deterministic nature of the universe. Well, I'm in a hurry. I can't wait a couple of centuries. You know, I don't, I really don't have that time. I have to go with the material available. And the material available tells me that the only non-deterministic, known non-deterministic part of the universe is the quantum part. But of course, that's the whole universe. The whole universe is quantum. So it's, it's oddball to think of it the way philosophers do is, well, that's just true of the little bitty micro particles down there at the level of the quarks and the muons. No, it's the whole system. But don't let anybody snow you with uh, with chaos theory. Chaos theory is totally deterministic. It's just you can't know. You know, everybody knows chaos theory. The favorite example in chaos theory is the butterfly flaps its wings in the Amazon basin, and the result is there's a rainstorm in San Francisco. Why? Well, then I say magic things about exponential effects. Uh, of the flapping of the butterfly wings. And this is why weather prediction, you can't give completely deterministic weather predictions uh, because of all those damn butterflies. Uh, because you got the, the, you got chaotic uh, mathematics uh, that gets in the way of deterministic weather predictions. But that's all epistemic. God could make the predictions because he knows the effect of all those butterflies. But where quantum mechanics is concerned, I am sorry about this, but anyway, here goes. Even God can't make the prediction because there's nothing to be predicted. That is, there's no fact to be known. Uh, I, I, whereas there is a fact to be known in the case of, of chaos theory or Brownian movement. So there are all sorts of other things that physicists will tell you are non-deterministic, but they, they don't know any physics. Uh, and, and, and they're, not, they're not making a clear distinction between the, uh, the ontological and the epistemic. Okay, I'm just going to summarize this. I'm, I, I'm getting a stomach ache by explaining this to you because I think it's very unsatisfactory. But anyway, here goes. There are two hypotheses. Hypothesis one is that we're totally deterministic. That fits well with what we know about how the universe works. Uh, and given the available evidence, it seems plausible. Hypothesis two says, no, the experience of uh, the gap is real. Uh, the gap actually matches something in reality. But if hypothesis two is true, uh, then you have to make a whole lot of very strange assumptions. Uh, one is you've got to assume that the quantum mechanical level is the right level for the explanation of consciousness. Two, that consciousness inherits the absence of causally sufficient conditions without inheriting the randomness, even though, of course, as I said, from the point of view of the physicist, it's still random because you can't predict the next stage on the basis of the previous stage. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop for questions about that. Uh, and let's see what, I mean, I, I, somebody, uh, you, Lauren had her hand up, yeah. Yes, no, that you could argue as follows that, uh, in fact, uh, consciousness is genuinely random, that it's not uh, a, um, uh, a deterministic process. Uh, so, and, and so you do get the uh, gappiness, but the illusion is that it's rational. Uh, the illusion is that there's a rational structure uh, to thought processes. That's another possibility. Uh, I guess if you've been able to swallow the elephant of saying that consciousness has a quantum mechanical explanation, then it's not a, it, it's much easier to swallow the idea that, well, rationality is real. See, here is the background to this that I haven't made full explicit, and that's this. The whole notion of rationality presupposes free will. Why? Because rationality must make a difference. There must be a difference between your rational thought processes that result in a rational decision and those that don't result in a rational decision, those that result in irrationality. So the, the application, rationality only works for conscious agents. But a conscious agent can only, uh, uh, rationality can only be real for a conscious agent I, if there is a, if there's free will, if the if the rational rational thought processes are able to make a difference, if it doesn't make any difference, if all this stuff is just going along for the ride, if it's all just epiphenomenal, then then rationality is just an illusion. Kant understood that. Kant understood that we have to uh, 
uh, presuppose free will in order to have rationality. And then, with his usual style, he cheats like crazy. What he says, and that's a technical term, by the way, what he says is, where free in the world of things in themselves, in the noumenal world, we're determined, however, in the phenomenal world, the world that we actually live in, the world where we can see things and do things and eat things. But underneath that world is a world we cannot perceive, and in that world we're free. Well, thanks a lot, Kant. My problem is that I've got to pay my taxes in the phenomenal world. I've got to I, I, I deal with my students and my colleagues and my publishers in the phenomenal world. And it's no use to be told, well, there's some world down there, and in that world, you're, you're truly free. That's no help to me at all. I, I, uh, we have to face up to the fact that we live in one world. Okay, other questions. That's a good question. Uh, other questions. I'll let everybody catch their breath. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. And so, wouldn't determinism apply on the neurobiological level, or would it also? Yes, that's the point. What I'm saying is, if if free will is true, it's got to be true all the way down. You see, if you have an absence of causally sufficient conditions here, not causally sufficient, each stage for the next, then you got to have that here. If not causally sufficient. But how could that be? To put it in words of one syllable, there are no gaps in the brain. You look in my brain, you won't see any gaps. There just are no holes in the brain. So the idea that free will is true at this upper level, if it's to be real, must be matched by a, a truth at the lower level. And at that lower level, you have to suppose a, that the standard approaches to the brain are inadequate, that they're fundamentally mistaken. Now, there is one other argument that I haven't mentioned, and that is we're not making much progress uh, with standard accounts of consciousness. The standard account takes the neuron as the functional unit, maybe masses of neurons or neuronal maps, but maybe that's the wrong level. Now, I have been using this picture for years, but I think it's uh, not a good picture. And the one I prefer is this one. And that says, think of the brain as a system made of neurons. And here are all these neurons. And the whole system is moving from left to right. And the, the system becomes conscious. Consciousness is the, is the scratchy uh, part of the chalk. I, 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 this seems to me, uh, they all seem dumb diagrams. But this diagram seems, seems to me less dumb than the other one. Uh, because the other one uses the metaphor of the top and the bottom. And that, you know, that suggests somehow, the problem with this picture is it suggests that consciousness is kind of on the surface of the brain. It's sort of like the surface of the water. And deep down underneath, there are all those fish swimming. I, I don't want to pursue that metaphor. But that's got to be wrong. It isn't that consciousness is on the surface. It's rather... The whole system is consciousness, and consciousness pervades the system. So this picture seems to me a better picture. And now, on this, in the terms of this picture, what we're saying is that the reason that the whole system can be indeterministic at the level of consciousness is that the relation between these by which they produce the next conscious state is not itself deterministic. It's not uh, based on causally sufficient conditions. And the only, as I've said over and over, the only part of the universe where we know that's to be the case is the quantum part. So we've got to suppose that the explanation of neuronal behavior is quantum uh, explanation. Now, I, I said the only argument for hypothesis two is that it's hard to see how to square evolution with complete determinism. But there is another argument that has occurred to me in the past 10 years or so, and that is standard deterministic accounts of the brain are not succeeding. We're not getting an account of consciousness. Uh, and we're n we know a lot more about the brain, a lot more, than we did when I first got interested in this subject. But the crucial things, we still don't know. We still don't know. Why exactly are you now conscious? Uh, what exactly happens in your brain 
uh, that makes you become conscious and what exactly happens when you stop being conscious. So we don't know the answers to that. The guy at the back with his hand up, yeah. Yeah. And fuel isn't so much an extra metabolic, like, the expensive task, but rather an inability to recognize yeah. what's happening. So it's, it shouldn't be more expensive, but rather less expensive because you're not, like, you know, recognizing these um, causal things. Well, you might fiddle around with it, but, the, but intuitively, you've, the feeling is, look, if determinism is true, then all of this hassle that I went through trying to figure out uh, which job should I accept, what house should I uh, buy, who should I get married to, uh, what career should I pursue, all of that was a total waste of time uh, because it was all going to happen the way it was going to happen. Que sera, sera. The, the, the whole thing was completely determined. Uh, you see, if I'm a car engine and I'm conscious, I might think, Boy, it's tough trying to decide whether or not to start on a cold morning. But what the hell? Let's start. Uh, and it's tough deciding whether or not to keep going. We know that's an illusion. The car engine makes no uh, dis uh, decisions. But if you put in a mechanism whereby the car engine uh, had to have a, a feeling that it was making decisions, deciding to get started, deciding to keep going, and the mechanism was very expensive, took much more gas than running the, the engine itself, I, uh, then you'd think that mechanism's a waste of time. It's just not worth uh, the, the, uh, the cost. Now, similarly, it's not worth a biological cost it's not, as you I'd use your terminology, it's not worth a metabolic cost of conscious decision making if it doesn't make any difference. If uh, evolution gave us this enormously expensive um, biological phenotype of conscious rational decision making, and the hypothesis of hypothesis one is it's a waste of time. It doesn't it doesn't make any difference. Yes, Lauren again. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what if consciousness is something like the like compensating for your blind spot in your eyes? Just something yeah. that makes the world easier. Well, okay, there are various ways to fiddle with it, and all you gotta do is look at my email. I tried to keep my email address secret, uh, but it's it's gotten out somehow. Uh, it's not a very hard one, Searle at Berkeley. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I get a lot of email about people who tell me, well, no, consciousness is still pretty damn useful even if we're uh, determinists. I, uh, I, it's pretty useful to have the conscious rational decision make because the illusion is what, I don't know, it stabilizes the hemoglobin or something. It, 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 the, the, the illusion has all sorts of useful functions. But I, I'm dissatisfied with that. I, I don't know how to resolve this because it's that kind of speculative uh, debate. Uh, what are the evolutionary advantages and disadvantages of having the experience of free rational decision making if the whole thing is an illusion? All right. Well, we didn't solve the problem of free will. Let's go on to the problem of the self. I'm a little reluctant to leave free will. Maybe I'll come back to it. Does anybody want to say some last thing about free will? I, I published this. Now, this has a long, a weird history. I gave some lectures in Paris. I think I told you this story. And I had no intention of publishing it. I, I, one of the lectures was about this. And uh, um, I must have signed something because a bundle of books arrived on my doorstep in French uh, where this was published. And it's called Liberté et Neurobiologie. I, and so that was immediately translated into German, uh, Spanish, uh, Chinese, and Italian. And the reviews, the, only, the reviews were wonderfully hostile, especially the Germans. Who does this Searle think he is? You know, he thinks he's got. Uh, one of the German reviewers said, real friendly reviews. Um, I, I, anyway, I didn't want to publish it, but then I, I got a, a word from a, a, a New York publisher, Columbia University Press, can we bring out an English translation? 
Well, I was slightly embarrassed. I don't want you to do an English translation of French. I can actually produce it in English. My English is pretty good. Um, so I, I, I agreed to publish it in English, but I'm slightly embarrassed by it because I think it's, as Austin would say, it's half-baked. It's not, uh, the ideas are not well worked out. You may have a chance to improve it on the exam. Uh, okay, well, let's go on to the self. Yeah, one last, I put it off for another minute, yeah. 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 Well, it, it, there is a this question. If you're a biological naturalist and you think the brain causes consciousness and consciousness an ordinary biological uh, phenomenon like digestion, then you have the question. Uh, and what about the consciousness of freedom? Is that, does that correspond to anything in the real world? And that's what I'm trying to answer. So technically speaking, biological naturalism could be true regardless of whether the will is free or not. Uh, they're just logically independent. You can have free will in biological naturalism or you can have determinism in biological naturalism. But anybody who thinks that the mind is a feature of the brain, then has to face the problem of free will. And I think you get a more intelligent formulation than you do if you're a dualist. If you're a dualist, remember what Descartes says, the brain is completely determined, the body's a machine like any other, but God attaches the soul to the body, and the soul is completely free. Well, what good does a free soul do if the body is completely determined? If, the, if the, all the behavior of the body is completely determined, what's the use of having a soul? My soul can raise my arm, but it was completely determined 13 billion years ago that my arm was going to go up there because the arm is part of the physical world. So this is an embarrassment uh, for any dualist. And it's not an embarrassment that I have as a, as a naturalist. But still, I got enough problems. I, I, I got plenty of problems even without that one, even without dualism. Say some more. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I feel like Descartes was, part of Descartes' problem with the mind-body problem was that uh, he wanted to explain what he said the free will and the determinism. Uh, that was one of his problems, and one of the motivations for dualism is that it sort of seems to give you a solution uh, yeah. to the problem of free will. But the real motivation, uh, I think, is if you postulate the mind is different from the body, uh, then when the body's destroyed, you needn't worry because you are your mind and your mind's going to go on. Yes, and Descartes doesn't have a good account. On my edition, he says on page 53, it's a paperback, we just experience free will. That's the argument for free will. Is we just have the experience of free will. That's not good enough. You got to know if that experience is valid. You got to know if it corresponds to anything in reality. So Descartes did not have a satisfactory solution. Now, as I told you before, uh, Kant thought he had a great solution, but he cheats. He says we're free in the, in the real world, but in the world we all have to live in, we're completely determined. That's no help to me. I, I get, uh, but anyway, maybe I should write something about that. But it's always tough to write about Kant because you, you're never sure you're getting it right. Yes? So, remind me again, how does Kant's uh, indeterminacy on the in the universe relate to our um, knowledge of these physical laws? Yeah. Is it just uh, another uh, fallacy for composition? Is no, we can. Level, the way that it works is this. Yeah. Let, let's suppose that hypothesis uh, two is true and that we really do have free will. Then our free will enables us to pursue science. And since the 17th century, we began to get systematic ways of finding out. And our indeterministic um, consciousness enables us to figure out, first of all, deterministic laws, that's Newtonian mechanics, and later on it enables us to discover indeterministic laws, uh, those are quantum mechanics. It is an, a scandal uh, that we have not given an intelligible account of quantum mechanics, and Feynman, who was as good as anybody at this, said, well, don't try to understand quantum mechanics. Just do the equations. Uh, if you try to understand it, it just, it, it, you start talking philosophy or something. He thought it would just be terrible. Uh, but that's no help to me. I want to know what it means. How does it work? 
uh, in ways that I can relate to, and I, I probably can't understand the equations, and I'm sure the equations are wonderful, but I would like a philosophically acceptable account, and there is none at present. We do not have a philosophically satisfying account. Incidentally, one of the things I'd like you to learn in this course uh, is a sense of the preposterous, uh, because there's no field in which more nonsense is talked uh, than in the philosophy of mind. Uh, and you have a wonderful check, your own experience, your own conscious experience. So if some guy tells you consciousness does not exist, you don't think, gosh, maybe he's right. You know, all you got to do is think what it's like to be you. Uh, or behaviorist. He says, well, really, there's just behavior. Uh, well, you know, in your own case, there's a big difference between uh, feeling a pain and behaving as if you felt a pain. You, you learned as a very small kid uh, to fake pains or at least to exaggerate the amount of pain that you had. At least if you didn't learn that, you, you, you had a, a very defective uh, education uh, in your childhood. Uh, uh, so there are all these things. Now there's another theory out nowadays it's, uh, which is in your assigned reading and it's a good exam question is what about the extended mind? Uh, if you think that functionalism is right, that um, I, the mental is really just part of, a, of an elaborate causal mechanism mediating input stimuli with output behavior, then there's no reason why the mind should stop at the skin because those causal relations continue. So, for example, this is part of my mind because I've actually, on this one, I actually have some notes, um, and that is part of my functioning. So if I were a two tear it up, I would literally be destroying a part of my mind. Uh, this view is so dumb I can't state it without embarrassment, but it is advanced by famous uh, philosophers and you, I, it's in your reading, uh, in the reader, one of the articles is called The Extended Mind. It's not to be taken seriously and it'll die in a few years, but it is preposterous on its face and it's a reductio ad absurdum of functionalism. Remember, what motivates it is the feeling if the mind is causal relations, if that's all there is, uh, then it's arbitrary to stop at the skin, and I agree. If the mind was just consisted of causal relations, then it would be arbitrary to stop at the skin. Uh, but of course, uh, what, uh, as Gil Harmon says, one man's modus ponens is another man's modus tollens. If the mind is causal relations, then the extended mind is true, but the mind is not causal. Uh, uh, relations, the extended mind is false, and that shows that the mind is not just causal relations. Uh, so I want you to be, I can't uh, spend a lot of time in class attacking every uh, bad theory that comes through, but I want you to have a nose for it. I want you to have a, a, a sense of reality. Okay, let's talk about the self for the few minutes we got left. I hope I answered your question adequately, because those are uh, good questions. The self, why is there a problem about the self? Well, if you look in standard dictionaries of philosophy, they usually tie uh, the self to personal identity. In fact, the classic encyclopedia of philosophy, under self, it says, see personal identity. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to tell you about uh, both of these problems. The problem of personal identity is what fact about me makes it the case that I'm the same person as the person who lectured here on Tuesday. Now you might say, well that's obvious, it's the same body. But we have the feeling that, well, it would still be me if I woke up in a different body. And it's impossible not to appeal to Kafka here. Uh, that Gregor Zamsa, you remember, in the Metamorphosis, wakes up in the body of a large instinct. But it's no question, it's still Gregor. So what fact about it makes it the case that it's Gregor. What fact about me makes me me if my body is not sufficient? My body's pretty useful, but a brain transplant is not logically impossible. Nobody knows how to do it, but you can imagine your brain transplanted into a different body, uh, and you would feel in some sense it's still me even though I, I'm now in a completely different body. Locke thought, well, it's memory. Uh, you can remember, uh, and it's your memory uh, that makes you the same. Leibniz picked that up, and he said, if you imagine uh, that you uh, became a Chinese emperor but forgot your entire life history, 
that would be exactly the same as supposing that you died and a new Chinese emperor came into existence. You are what you remember. You are your memory. Now, various philosophers, notably Hume, pointed out that there's a logical problem with that, and that is identity is transitive. If A is identical with B and B is identical with C, then A is identical with C, but you don't get that kind of transitivity with memory. And I think this example comes from Hume. I forget where I remember I, where I read it, but here's how it goes. The old general remembers his life as a young lieutenant. The young lieutenant remembers his childhood as a small boy, but the old general has forgotten his childhood as a small boy. If memory is all there is, then it looks like you would have to say, well, the old general is identical with the lieutenant, and the lieutenant's identical with the boy, but the old general is not identical with the boy, and that seems like a reductio ad absurdum. Now, maybe we can fiddle around with that. We do feel there's something special about memory, uh, that if we lost all of our memory, in a sense, it would be a kind of death. Uh, that the extreme, I told you about the tragedy of Ronald Reagan, uh, that in his last days, he had forgotten not only that he'd ever been president of the United States, but he uh, forgot even how to speak English. Uh, so they say that he, he gave signs that he could still recognize his wife, but essentially he no longer related uh, as the same person uh, to his surroundings and to other people in a way that would require his memory. It is a remarkable tragedy, uh, and it is one that's going to afflict uh, uh, a high percentage of us in this room uh, unless we can get a solution, unless we can attack uh, the problem of Alzheimer's disease. The problem, one of the problems is this. You feel in the case, I'm sorry to give you this depressing, uh, these depressing thoughts, but one of you feel, well, look, I'd rather be dead than really be a vegetable. Uh, better dead than be in a situation that Reagan was in in his last days where you couldn't, remember, you couldn't speak to anybody. The problem is if you're still in a situation where you can rationally decide whether or not you should be dead or alive, then you should probably choose to stay alive. The point, however, is you reach a point where you'll be better off dead, but at that point you're no longer able to make the decision. Does everybody see this paradox? Uh, now, you might think, well, that's pretty abstract. The difficulty is if you look around to your left and right, I, uh, <clears throat> at least one of the people on your left or your right uh, after the age of 80 will have Alzheimer's. 50% of the population gets it. And it has two uh, extremely uh, depressing uh, features. Uh, one is it's, there is no cure. You're not going to get over it. And number two, it's invariably fatal. Uh, you're like, at that age, you might be killed by something else first. But if you're not killed by something else, you'll be killed by Alzheimer's. I, how the hell did I get off onto this? I had a cheerful topic of, free, of, of the self. Let's go back to the self. Okay, so there is <clears throat> the problem of the self, and that is what fact about me makes me me. Now, the inclination, and I feel this inclination, is to say, all the same, there's something that it feels like to be me. I can sort of imagine what it's like uh, to wake up uh, let's say, as Princess Diana on her last day. It certainly doesn't feel like me waking up, but I can kind of imagine uh, what that would have been like. But it's not like waking up as me. When I wake up, there's a certain reassuring feel. Yeah, it's this is me, okay. We feel there, that there is uh, an awareness of our, uh, uh, of our sense of the self. Now, Hume uh, was part of a tradition where people took this uh, seriously, and people thought, it was quite commonly thought, each of us is aware of ourself. We each have an awareness <coughs> of ourself as the same person through time. So the self guarantees personal identity because each of us is aware of ourself, and our self persists through time. Our self remains the same self across uh, time and change. But Hume, within, with his usual skeptical power, says there's no such experience. Uh, if you examine, you turn your attention inward, you try to grasp the nature of yourself, and you do the philosophical bit 
where you're in a, uh, by yourself in a room, you sit next to your desk and you grab your forehead with a good philosophical grip and concentrate hard. What is the self? What is I? And it sounds a lot better in German. Was ist das ich? You say to yourself, sound, trying to sound like a German philosopher. And Hume says, I've done this, and I tell you what I come up with. Uh, I get a feeling on the, of my hand on my forehead, and I can hear the sound of my voice. Oh, yeah, and that slight headache, that's that stuff I drank last night. What, what, oh, yeah, I don't want to think about that. But in any case, what you get are specific experiences. There is no experience of the self. Now, as usual, Hume makes it look as if, well, I looked around, I couldn't find a self. You know, maybe some guy trained in metaphysics will be able to find a self. Maybe somebody was took, taking the advanced courses, says Hume. But he's being sarcastic there. What he means is, not only do you not have an experience of the self, but you couldn't because no experience you had would count as an experience of the self. It wouldn't meet the conditions. So if you said, well, I experience the self, it's a big yellow blotch on the left side of my visual field. That's just a yellow blotch like any other. That there is no experience which is such that it would provide it would provide a binding principle that would bind your other experiences together. Conclusion: There is no self, and there couldn't be a self. Okay, I'm going to answer that next Tuesday.